Ladies and gentlemen, thank you once again for tuning into NeighborhoodNewsStudio.com. I'm your producer slash host for today, Andy Dabala, and we got a great lineup ahead of us today. Uh, we're going to kick off uh, the the day with a McDuff Lives replay. He interviewed uh, a journalist from Moscow named Riley Wagaman a a couple weeks ago, and uh, we really wanted to highlight some parts of the inter- interview and and let the audience re-engage um, Riley again. Then at 12 p.m., George Webb, he's on the Ukrainian border in Poland. Uh, he's thinking about going through, ladies and gentlemen, and he'll be joining us at 12 p.m. for his regularly scheduled show, Research Roadshow. Then we have a Mark Kulak replay coming on at 4 p.m. this evening, continuing the breakdown of the virus vaccine game. Then 4 p.m., Dr. Bose and Chris Hunter are, are going to come come, come again live once again at 4 p.m. on Chris's show, The IP Hunter. Then to close out the, the, the day's schedule, Peter Duke with the Duke Report will be live at 5 p.m. So make sure uh, you, our fellow patriots, that's you guys out there in the audience, uh, stay tuned to NeighborhoodNewsStudio.com. Save us into your favorites and send out these videos to your friends and family members. Share them to your social media accounts because these are very important. We're battling the mainstream news media right now and and the narratives they are trying to push with the virus, the vaccines, and now this Ukrainian-Russian war. And we're on top of the truth here at NeighborhoodNewsStudio.com. So make sure you give us a like and a share. And just to let the audience know, We started something a little bit new here at Neighborhood News Studio uh, com. It's called NNS 24-7. I guess if you click on it, you have to you have to subscribe. Um, But within the if you go to that little clubs and membership sign up, you can sign up for NNS 24-7. You get unlimited access to the video archive. All of our all of our videos that we do with all of our journalists are under a paywall now at NNS 24-7. So you will be able to find the videos there. Enjoy reading the uh, the blogs as are some of our journalists as we go, and our research, our very valued research, the basis of what we do here at Neighborhood News Studio, will be available at NNS twenty four seven as well. So you guys can participate and continue on with the research, and that is all available at neighborhoodnewsstudio.com so without further ado here's the video of uh of of john lachlan interviewing wiley riley wegeman like i mentioned earlier he's a journalist from moscow and he he's got some important insights that mcduff thought were important that we need to that we need to reinvestigate so um here we go and this is all available at mcduff lives three And hello, everyone. I'm John O'Loughlin. Welcome to my channel. It's called McDuff Lives 3. And uh, it's a good morning here from Mystery Island on the east coast of the U.S. But I think it must be good evening to Riley Wagaman over there in Moscow, Russia. Am I right, Riley? It is. It's 7, 7 p.m. in Moscow. Outside of Moscow. I shouldn't say Moscow. I'm a little outside of the city, but yeah. Okay, well, I'm a little outside of DC myself, so I know what you, I know how you feel. It's uh, it, it, I'm a Washingtonian native, actually, so uh, it's my city. Although I'd hardly recognize it now when I go down there, and it's just it's changed. And I hate to see the fences uh, around our public buildings. You know, that's that's just uh, obscene to me. So anyway, but uh, that's nothing compared to what you're encountering over there in in Moscow, isn't it? area around you, but you are a journalist and a, a, a very exciting and fun writer, and I love writing, reading your stuff on Substack. Uh, you've been there, as I understand, about nine years. Uh, before that, you were in Czechoslovakia, and a uh, person of my generation can't help but thinking of the two wild and crazy guys from uh, from uh, Saturday Night Live, uh, uh, Aykroyd and Steve Martin. Uh, did you run into them in Czechoslovakia? I didn't, no. <laughs> my time in Southern, Southern Moravia. I didn't see them, unfortunately. 
Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about what you did see in the, in that area, and uh, give us a little bit of, of just off off the cuff, uh, uh, get to getting to know you about uh, Riley and uh, a little bit of your journey. Sure. Well, I mean, I started actually. I started writing, I guess you would say, professionally, even when I was still in college. Uh, it's funny even to look back on it, but actually, I got invited by the Huffington Post when the Huffington Post was like the big thing. Do you remember like back 10 years ago? Yeah. And I was writing um, Huff, Huff Post had started a college section. And so I had been I was invited to write for the Huff Po college section because I was in college and I had some connections through some um, friends I had in media. So I would just write these sort of very uh, sardonic, bitter commentaries about life in you know American liberal arts colleges and uh, and I did that and once I graduated I went to DC and I worked tried to work as a tried to make a living writing about politics and I did every I mean I did like movie reviews for the Washington Times I mean I did anything anything that anyone would give me I did so um, and all sorts of stuff but you know basically, Within a year and a half, I was totally burnt out. And I went to the Czech Republic. I, in my college years, I had studied German. And when I was in Germany, all my friends were Czechs who were studying German. So I just called up my Czech friends and said, I want to come to, I'm sick of America. I want to come to Central Europe. And they're like, come over, hang out. So I ended up just, I went really hardcore Bohemian. You know, I worked like maybe twice a week, just tutoring English. Just drank a lot of beer, hung out, did a little bit of writing, but nothing serious. And um, then I was like, I got to do something more with my life, you know? So I decided to, I was like, I got to go somewhere. Where should I go? And I found a job uh, teaching at a private English school in Bashkortostan, which is a republic in the Russian Federation. It it's is? Like, yep. Yeah. So <laughs> Russia has... Russia has 85 regions. It's a very large country. <laughs> and so one of these regions is a, basically a semi-autonomous, I mean, it's, it's part of Russia, but it's, it's called Bashkortostan, the Republic of Bashkortostan. And um, so I taught there for about a year. And this was actually white, right when I arrived. So I arrived, I, I think I arrived in maybe January, late January, 2014. And that was right when... Maidan was kicking off really hardcore, like in Ukraine with the whole color revolution there. So I arrived right when the Ukraine crisis was really getting crazy. And in February of that year, February 2014, is when the government was overthrown and the whole crisis in East Ukraine started and, you know, the civil war and everything. Where were and you so at that time? I was, I was in Bashkortostan at that time. I was in Bashkortostan. And, and just, so I was, well, give me an idea how far that is from Ukraine, or is it, you know, just generally? Where is it's, it? Uh, it's like next to, like, uh, it's like in the Ural region. So it's it's not quite Siberia, but, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's maybe two-hour, hour-and-a-half plane ride to Moscow, maybe. I don't even remember. Okay, that helps So it's sense. like, it's like s southern, southern, s southern, like, middle, I guess you would say, of Russia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway... So I was there, for example, for when uh, Crimea like reunified with Russia, which was a very like interesting time to be in Russia because there was huge, I mean, euphoria and people were super excited about it. And I mean, it was it was a very, very interesting time to be in Russia um, for that. And of course, also just with the Ukraine crisis and the situation in Donbass, it was very, you know, there was a lot going on. So right when I got into Russia, and it's so funny, too, because I came to Russia thinking like, I'll just hang out in Russia. No one will bother me. I can finally get away from politics. You know, <laughs> and it's like, what was I thinking? I don't know. But um, so anyway, so this happens. And I was like, I should probably start writing again, I guess, because I'm in Russia. Russia is now a big topic. And, uh, you know, I can't like teach English the rest of my life. It's not really my passion at all is something I do to, you know, pay the bills. So I ended up moving to Moscow and I worked first for a sort of a startup website called Russia Insider. And then I got a job with Press TV, 
which is the Iranian um, state broadcaster. I worked as their Moscow correspondent. And then I ended up at RT. I worked for RT for about four years. And now I'm solo. So that's like my, that's my Russia media bio. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I have to ask, uh, you, you couldn't possibly have been fluent in all those languages. Uh, nevertheless, they, uh, they hired you. Uh, how did that work? Actually, with so with uh, press TV with Iran was really funny because I mean my Russian still I have to I'm ashamed of how bad it is even still today. But when I was working for press TV, it was like not good at all. And so I had this my sidekick, my Russian TV like cameraman guy, and we were a team here in Moscow and. We just really winged it hardcore, just trying to figure out, like, you know, how are we going to translate this? And I would try to prepare my questions, you know, in Russian beforehand and memorize them to the people I was interviewing. And but you know, it was a great, it was a great time to be in Russia. And I was also here for the World Cup. You know, I guess that was 2018. I guess it's amazing, amazing time. I'm not even a sports fan. I don't even watch football, or soccer. It was amazing. It was, it was amazing to see all the different countries here. Moscow, I've never seen more vibrant and optimistic and full of life. It was a super cool time. I mean, I've seen some really great things, you know, during my time here in Russia. And so it's just so, it's heartbreaking. It's really, really heartbreaking to see what's happening now and scary, like horrifying. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and get into this then. Um, what, what would you, if you could speak to, you know, the population of the United States and, and tell them, look, guys, here's what you really need to know. You, you, you need to know these things. Uh, and and uh, what, what would you think would be the most beneficial information or even, even opinions that you could pass on to your average American that really, I mean, we're still good people, but we're getting controlled by our media in a in a horrific way, faster and faster. Every moment, it's something's getting getting censored, and it's starting to look like they're preparing us for uh, a propaganda uh, barrage that will lead to war. I'm, I'm so I'm, I'm I'm reaching out to you to say, well, what do you think, from your point of view, that we could say or do or demonstrate to the American people to 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 get this thing called off? Yeah, I mean, it's so, it's hard to even know where to begin. I mean, I think the reality here, in my, in my opinion, the way I see this is, <clears throat> I do think that Russia has been very, very, very poorly treated uh, by not even Washington, but the international community, that it had quite reasonable uh, requests negotiate tried to negotiate you know over several years on a number of issues that were extremely important to russia like for russia's own security uh and basically what has happened here is i i do believe that while i have to say that i feel like what russia is doing was i believe not not what should have been done. I don't. I don't see a good way out for anyone, and that's that's what I mean by that. I don't. I don't see how Russia gets out of this or any of us in a good way. The reality is, I think that Russia was provoked in such a way where, for whatever reason, the Kremlin decided that it had enough and it was going to take military action. And the idea that Russia did this without any warning, or you know, that it was just sort of this random decision just to, you know, go crazy or whatever, however, whatever you want to describe what's happening is just totally wrong. And so I think as Americans, especially as Americans, where, I mean, Americans, we've been, you know, drone bombing half the world for the last 30 years, you know, uh, for under the most bizarre pretexts. And so the, what I would say here is, I really, really hope that we could find a way to de-escalate this as opposed to pretend that we have some sort of this sort of righteous indignation that I see a lot uh, where basically Americans are being encouraged to start World War III, which is insane. And at this point, it doesn't even matter who's right or wrong. I mean, we're talking about something very, very scary. And 
again, I'm going to stress this. I do not condone what's happening. I don't. I really don't. And also, there's a lot of censorship here in Russia. Like, you can't even call it a war. They, they, can, they fine you and they can put you in prison. You have to call it a special military operation. So something has gone terribly wrong. And I don't want to, you know, I guess you could talk a long time about what that is. But it, we're reaching this point where people are not communicating with each other. We're not thinking clearly. And it's very, very scary. And so if you're an American sitting at home feeling, you know, let's, you know, let's get the Russians. I mean, what, how does that, what, what's the end game here, guys? Like, seriously, you know, I have a son. He's, I mean, he's Russian, but his, uh, his grandmother is Ukrainian. She came right from Ukraine. So, you know, I've got a son who's like a Russian, Ukrainian, American. So... I don't know what to say, guys. Like, we're just human beings, you know, <laughs> and n- none, of, none of us are innocent. Uh, and I would like to all, all, all of us to live, you know, nice, peaceful, happy lives. As all I see are just looking, just looking at how this is being handled. I am truly, genuinely terrified that we're going to see escalation. And, and how does that end well for anyone? I just don't understand it. Well, I wish it looked better from my point of view, but you know, this you know, I've been trying to tell people myself that uh, this is this is very very serious, and and you know, our prop- our our media is just completely full of propaganda, as as if you know they 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 were just parroting the the line of the of of the of, of the Western uh, supporters of of the Ukrainian side in this and. I mean, we had this just this sudden appearance of blue and yellow flags everywhere, and all all yeah, over yeah. social media and all that stuff. I I, I see a, a a barrage of of propaganda uh, just being shoveled at us. And for instance, if you look at uh, at a report trying to say, well, what what's going on on the battleground? You know, let's look at the map. Let's watch things move around and see what's happening. Um, you hear about uh, the Russians are uh, are now targeting civilians. They say, and I just I don't believe that. I don't believe that the Russians are targeting civilians. I, I think it makes much more sense to look at the the what they're doing as a encirclement of the cities without trying to hurt anybody. And of course, there's going to be casualties. Uh, it's war. I mean, it's not war to put it your way, but uh, it's not. It's a it's a seriously uh, uh, damaging not war in which people are definitely getting killed and the innocent people are getting killed. But to emphasize that, as opposed to looking at the history, is a is a great sin, I think, because uh, you have to look at the history of of of, of these. Uh, uh, um, I guess blood and soil might be the way to de- define them. Uh, you know the groups I'm talking about, like the the famous one, the Azovs, and but. One of the things we've done in, in our channel here is, is to look at the history of this going back into World War II and, and to find really that these people are, are being, have been sponsored all, all through the Cold War, all up to now, by secret funding from U.S. and Western British uh, intelligence agencies. So it, it looks like a bunch of blood and soil, you know, jerks that are uh, doing this, but they couldn't be doing it without financing. They couldn't have, have survived since World War II without a continuous uh, uh, mentor and supporter and behind the scenes. So I think we need to hold the American uh, intelligence service and the British as well uh, responsible for some of this. Um, what, what does it look like from your point of view? No, I mean, absolutely. You know, again, this idea that, uh, you know, that, what Russia is doing is this sort of, you know, um, just this sort of imperial land grab or whatever. I mean, maybe it's that, but the idea that there was no provocation that the West has, that there's no blame on for decades of Western policy here. And as you pointed out, I mean, the reality here, look, I, I'm also, I also feel like there needs to be nuance here because the reality is that the very vast majority of Ukrainians are just normal people minding their own business. They're not neo-Nazis. They're not ultra-nationalists. In fact, they're very, very similar to you and me and every Russian on earth. But the reality is, the basic reality here is that there are ultra-nationalist neo-Nazi elements 
in Ukraine that have been armed and trained by basically us, by the West, and, and you know, supported directly in this way and by the Ukrainian government and uh, given support in this way. Does this mean that, you know, Russia should have in, should go into Ukraine now? I mean, the problem that I have is not that I don't, I understand Russia's grievances. I really do because I live here. The problem is that I'm very, very concerned that what Russia is doing now is just going to make it worse. You know, like you're basically, I, I believe that we're, we're going to see a situation where you're going to galvanize the most extreme elements in Ukraine. I think that that's just human nature, you know, and uh, I'm very, very concerned again that NATO and the West will use this as an opportunity to flood weapons into Ukraine and, you know, make basically a Somalia situation. I mean, it's it's very, very concerning. And it, one one would hope that there was no other option. Right. That this was the best, you know, the, the best, worst option. But it's just it's very, very scary. And, and again, sorry to go back to your original point, though, is that I think that the only sane way out of this is to realize that both sides have responsibility here. Both sides have blame. And we really, really have the one aim here should be de-escalation immediately, because allowing this to go on. I mean, I really do believe this is like. We're talking about something very, very dark. I mean, it's already gotten very dark, you know, and. It's really sad. Like you said, you know, it's so obvious to me that there is some sort of weird psyop going on where, you know, one day you had half of Facebook with their little, you know, double masked selfies. And now everyone has Ukrainian flags. Like, how does that happen? And it's just it, and it's scary because. I mean, look, I'm an American, so I guess I could say this, but man, Americans are so brainwashed, like they're so easy to manipulate. You just like you just give them something new to hate or to support. They're just like you can just mold them like clay overnight. And, and this is the thing, too, is that I don't I think that obviously I understand like why someone would say I don't I think that, you know, this not war is bad. The violence should end. But this sort of in, like almost fanaticism that we're seeing. Does this actually lead to peace? Is this actually going to make things better? And I think no, I think we're heading for something really, really bad. You know, my, my own study leads me to believe that the reason that we can't have peace is because uh, the powers that be don't want peace. I mean, we, we, we could settle everything. We, we, yeah. could feed, we could feed everybody. We could make yep. everybody comfortable. We could have longer lives and healthier lives, and we don't have to suffer uh, through deprivations and famine and all that. I mean, as I was thinking yesterday, I mean, Ukraine is like – you know, was the breadbasket of the Soviet Union and could easily be the breadbasket of Europe or anywhere else. It's it's uh, famous for its rich soil and uh, the the tradition of of growing uh, food products there is 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 well known. And plus, there's so many other resources to be had. This is really uh, come down to a question of you know, does Henry Kissinger get to call the shots? Or not. In, in my view, the, 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 the most sensible way to, to look at this is through the eyes of, of uh, the history of, of Mr. Kissinger and his, his upbringing, his training at, at Harvard and his experience in, uh, in Germany during the war and working for the, uh, the, CI, the American CIC and his, his connections that indicate to me that he's been facilitating the Soviets or the Americans to whatever, whichever it makes it, it easier for him to achieve his goals. And his goals, in my mind, are nothing more than domination of the entire world, the entire planet. So uh, I lay it, I lay it at, at his doorstep right now. I don't know how much uh, Henry Kissinger gets credit for anything anymore. He's kind of old. But I, I, think, I think, you know, he's got sufficient uh, um, therapy to keep his brain, his brain working. Um, is Henry Kissinger a factor in the minds of, of, of Russians, either the, 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 the uh, intelligentsia or the common people? Is he somebody they talk about? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, a lot, a lot of these sort of, you know, Soviet, you know, Cold War era thinkers. I mean, Ukraine was always sort of this target, right? It was always this goal for Washington policymakers, this idea that 
there's no there's no Russia without Ukraine. That Ukraine was really the key, and that if you wanted, uh, you know, to basically either dismantle or you know neutralize Russia, Ukraine was the way to do it. And you know, I mean, let's be honest here. Uh, the reality is, I mean, that Washington basically supported a coup d'état in Ukraine in 2014, one that was put in a government that was extremely hostile to Russia. As Americans, we have to wonder what would happen if Russia overthrew the government of Mexico and put in a regime that was openly hostile to the United States. I mean, would we tolerate that? That being said, what disturbs me is that eight years have gone by, and unfortunately, and I don't know why, but Russia's solution, I guess, was this not war. And it just it I don't bothers know me that in a country like Ukraine, where you think that you'd be able to have some sort of, you know, uh, asymmetrical ways of dealing with this, that they chose the most, you know, I have a hammer and you're a nail approach to this. Uh, I mean, I'll give you one example, like a concrete example of this is that the reason why I'm disturbed by what's happening is, for example, in Ukraine, you had well, Ukraine's largest opposition party is a pro-Russia party. It's called um, For Life. And it's run by their main guy's co-chair. His name is um, Yuri Boyko, I believe. And this guy came out the other day and said, we oppose the, in, the Russian aggressors and we're going to like arm our people and like help stop them. So you went from a situation where you had a opposition, you know, parties, a large one. It was the second largest party in Ukraine that was working for, you know, basically neutrality in Ukraine, which is very, very important for, you know, Russia's strategic aims. That is now helping to, you know, it's like part of is openly resisting what's, you know, this special operation. And again, it's just, it's just so tragic. And how do we get out of this? I don't know. And and you'd you have to you'd have to hope that there's something else going on behind the background here that we don't understand. But on the face of it, just looking at what's happening, I just I'm very very concerned. I'm very very just as a human being, you know, it's, it's gone way beyond politics for me. So. One of the points that is a talking point in in the media that I watch is is the bio labs, uh, the yeah, the, and the. The history of those is, has actually been a subject of, of a lot of my colleagues um, just studying it from the point of view of, of, the, of the recently demised pandemic um, and from the medicine, trying to understand the medicine of it and how does, how does this really work and what's, what's this really made of. And, and then, you know, we've done a lot of studies into the, the programs of, of biological uh, weaponry since World War II, both by Americans and and, and also uh, it looks like another case of, you know, here's a, here's an advance, and then suddenly the Russians have it, you know, and suddenly the Russians right. come up with something that that's really really scary. So we better come up with something that's even scarier, and and that back and forth is you know that's that's what I call the Kissinger plan to to just make make sure that there's enough deadly stuff everywhere that if they ever want to pull the trigger they can get rid of of 90 percent of us um that, that at any rate one one hope is that russia will be able to come up with evidence that the united states and uh, it, and its allies have been um operating these illegal laboratories in ukraine and if they can do that, then that could very well take down the Biden administration because of his son's admin involvement in Burisma and, uh, and all of that, which I, I, you know, a lot of folks have been following that very closely, uh, the Hunter Biden saga. Um, if that happens, then we may very well have this uh, Biden administration uh, gotten rid of because the American people would not stand for um, um, blatant evidence of that type of biological warfare uh, going on, you know, with our our uh, our Congress, you know, funding it, but pretending that it doesn't exist. 
And yeah. we've got this this denial going on right now that I think maybe get broken through uh, with recent comments by uh, Victoria Newland uh, and uh, really uh, a lot of publicity coming out. So maybe maybe Putin was right in the sense of this biological warfare is is a is an imminent threat. I, I've heard other people say that uh, well, it's it, Putin recognizes an existential threat. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but is is the is the issue of these bio labs uh, on the radar screen in in your world? They are. I mean, I've done some poking around to this because people have sent me, you know, articles on this, and obviously, you know, just right off the bat, anything bio lab related with the United States in a foreign country. I mean, obviously, for me, that's a red flag. Uh, what I would say though about this, again, just trying to keep balance here is if you listen to the Russian government's, even Putin's statement uh, where he basically announced that Russia was going in, there was no, there was no mention of biolabs anyway. He mentioned, he mentioned uh, he had a, it was a, almost a 40 minute address and with a long list of grievances, but there was nothing about the biolabs and the, the government position, like the government statements, they have made statements since uh, through the Ministry of Defense and also, I think, at the government level, for ministry, came a few days after. And what worries me about that, just to be perfectly honest, is that even before they started hyping the biolab stuff, there were stories in Russian media about how Zelensky or how Ukraine allegedly maybe possibly had been, you know, shipped some plutonium, you know, like under the under the table by the United States. And for me, I have to be honest. And again, this is just me as an American, knowing how wars work. To me, these sound like Russia digging for pretexts, you know? Like, it's not easy to find strong reasons to, you know, intervene in another country. So it's hard to say. I'm not, what I'm saying, what I would say to this is that I think that these bio labs probably aren't good. And what I would say to add to that is that I'm very, very concerned that actually some sort of dangerous pathogen, whether knowingly or unknowingly, will be leaked. And what's going to end up happening is that both sides will blame each other, you know? And we're basically going to have, we could have like a re, like an actual real dangerous pathogen out there. Both sides blame each other. It's Russia's fault because they invaded and they made the, you know, Ukraine insecure. It's America's fault because they had the bio labs in Ukraine and they were possibly plotting something. And now, you know, everything's worse. It's just, that's, that's the main point. I, honestly, this is what I want to say more than anything. It's like, I'm really not even looking at this as like uh, Russia's right or the United States is right anymore. It's just like, I just, the possibilities for us, like getting basically called, like is extremely high at this point. I really, I really do believe that. I really do believe that we're entering a situation where there's so many var like possibilities, so many variables, so many ways it could go wrong. That it, it terrifies me, and not just as an American sitting in Moscow, but as an American, you know, seeing, you know, I'm concerned for everyone, Ukrainians, Russians, whatever, and that's what scares me the most. And I have to say honestly that after two years of the what I consider to be a, basically a public health scam, a global public health scam, where you know we were lied to, and manipulated, and forced to do horrible, dehumanizing, anti-human things, that undoubtedly killed so many people who didn't need to die and abused us in terrible ways it scares me that that these new variables are on the table for these same people whoever they are whatever they want terrifies me so yeah yeah me too uh and i all i can say is that please you know guys uh my dear friends, you know, guys, I, I, I know you didn't we didn't want to vote for Trump. I understand that. You, it makes sense to me. I wouldn't ever have voted for Trump either. But, oh, my God, you know, Trump would not be we wouldn't be in this war right now if, if it weren't for Biden and, and his his team. And, and they are. They are just a, a puppet. They're regime. horrible. They're horrible. They're, the, they're the Biden, horrible. the whole Biden thing, and especially with Biden's connections to Ukraine. I mean, it's really disgusting like the deeper you go. And Ukraine really is this sort of armpit of American corruption. It really is. 
And that's not to say that, you know, that that justifies, you know, innocent civilians dying in, in you know, Kharkiv, but it's really sad that at least the American coverage of what's going on here doesn't put this into context. It doesn't point out why, how this, you know, there's clear, we're just not seeing the full picture here, you know, and, and that's why I'm so worried because when, when people aren't looking at each other's viewpoints and, and considering each other's concerns, legitimate concerns, that's when things go really, really bad. Yeah. The other thing that he was saying was uh, we're going to denazify. Um, and uh, what I, I can, I can almost see the idea of circling the cities of the Ukraine with military and, you know, really doing a siege with the idea of sending in your special forces to find the, the ones that, that, that uh, are in the blood and soils groups and, uh, and, uh, you know, taking them out. Uh, and I think Putin said pretty much the same thing. Um, I see on the maps that it looks like the cities are getting encircled and it does look to me like that is Putin's strategy. Uh, do people talk about uh, the Russian strategy at all? I know, I know you, you, you've you already said you don't, you know, think of it as the winners and losers, but just from from a point of view of, of a, a bird's eye view of it, does it look that way that, that they're circling and then they're going to come in and squeeze out the, the bad guys? You know, I'm not, I'm, I have, I have actually a friend I can recommend to you. Um, he writes this website called antiempire.com and he's very, very good with sort of the, um, just looking at the conflict from just maps and the strategy elements of it. It's excellent. I highly recommend uh, this site to everyone. Antiempire.com. Yeah. Anti-empire.com. It's really, he's very good. And he's one of the only, in, as far as I know, one of the only sort of alternative media analysts who said, there's this giant Russian military buildup on Ukraine. I think they're going to like go in. And I was like, oh, no, that's Western propaganda. They'll never do uh, it. Me and, too. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And I understand why people said that. I do. But Marco was like, you either – this is either like the biggest fake out in human history or the Russians are invading. Like that's the only – that's the only option. Like those are the only two options. So – Anyway, he's very, very good. He's very, very objective. He's not pro-U.S. or pro-Russia necessarily. He just calls it like he sees it. And I really, rec I really recommend this website, Anti-Empire. But what I would say about this, you know, um, the problem with this, this is what I'd say about the denazification thing. Again, I've written about this extensively, and I've been in Donbass. I've, I was in Donetsk twice in 2015. So I've, I've seen the handiwork of right sector and all these, you know, creepy punitive battalions. The problem, though, is like, again, let's consider the, the methods that are being used here. I mean, we're basically sending in uh, not like special forces, but an entire, you know, battalions of Russian soldiers to weed out what are a minor, a very small minority of Ukrainians. And the problem here is like what how, how to do this in an effective way where you come out on top. You know, and, and that's what concerns me the most. With the, with the military operation in general, I'd have to say that if you looked at the coverage of uh, what was expected, I mean, I think that the idea was that Russia would be able to end this pretty quickly. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that this is getting dragged out. Whatever Russia's intentions are, however good they are, the longer you're staying in Ukraine means the more suffering for everyone. You know, and that that really concerns me. And, it cons and I feel horrible for the Russian soldiers. I feel horrible for the Ukrainians. Obviously, I don't feel that bad for these Azov guys. But, you know, they're sort of at, at some point you have to wonder, like, what's the cost benefit here? You know, like, are we going to encircle Mariupol and basically send, you know, tens of thousands of refugees out of the country and, and, and liquidate these guys? And, and what's the damage here? It just... Things have gotten very, very extreme, you know, and we have to think really carefully about how, how what again, what's the exit ramp, right? Okay, like let's say, uh, you know, all these weirdo right wing battalions are wiped out. It's like, does Russia just drive home? I mean, I feel like they'll just 
this will just galvanize the most extreme elements of Ukrainian society, in, in my opinion. And NATO will take advantage of it. I mean, NATO has, you know, they had what, like Operation Gladio, right, which has been going on for 50 years, where they yeah. basically trained terrorists, right wing terrorists, to kill like socialist, you know, to destroy socialist governments in Italy. So it's, again, the problem here is not that I, I understand Russia's grievances 100%. And I'm just so concerned, though, that what's happening is, is going to lead to more pain and suffering for us all. And I don't necessarily blame Russia. And I don't necessarily blame the United States. It's just like, what do we do, guys? Like, I don't know. I don't know the way out of this. I really don't. And I've been thinking about a lot about it. Like, what's the best case scenario here? And I don't know. And it's scary. It's really scary. We can, we can fight uh, power, you know, only two ways. We can, we can fight it with, with uh, moral uh, indignation and, and uh, shaming them and, you know, doing what I try to do on my Facebook page and wake up other people and, and, and spread the word that, hey, this is very, very serious. And, you know, nothing could do that um, more than hearing a, a correspondent in Moscow tell him, telling us that he's terrified. And I'm terrified, too. And I think we all should be terrified enough to uh, settle down and stop and just take take account of where, where this thing is, is going. It, the power... Um, Confronting power with power right now is is not the answer, I guess. Um, yeah, it, it yeah, seemed that's to me a good that, way to put it. Yeah, you know, Putin's Putin, I guess, might might have pulled the last, you know, the last uh, old ground war. Uh, you know, you know, sending tanks into a. You know, I mean, my God, you know, <laughs> this is where World War Two happened. This is this is yeah, the, yeah. This is the. It's really, most, I mean. Yeah, sorry, not to cut up, but, uh, you know, I spend a lot of time on Telegram, you know, one of these sort of uh, messaging uh, uh, apps. And uh, I spend a lot of time browsing through uh, sort of like the, the pro-Russian Telegram channels and the pro-Ukrainian Telegram channels and looking at the footage, you know, and the photos they post of what's going on. And it, I'm telling you, I don't think anyone is really seeing the full picture here. I mean, I really think that what's happening is – if people saw the stuff that's actually, and so, uh, undoubtedly on both sides, there's propaganda and fakes and stuff like that, but there's no way to fake all of this. There's no way to fake all of this. And the stuff you see, I've been talking about like charred bodies hanging over blown up tanks, screaming, you know, everyone destroyed neighborhoods. And I'm not blaming anyone. I don't even know who did it, but I mean, ambushes with just horrible things, horrible. I mean, we're talking about hell. Really, like living hell, watching it happen live. It's terrible. It's a real war. This is like, it's, it's just, it's really, really, really upsetting. And again, like my family, my son is Ukrainian and Russian, and yeah. I'm an American, and I don't want any of this, you know? So, wow. Um, yeah. Well, maybe a, another way to look at it for. Is we haven't really looked at the European angle of it. I, I think there's the, the Moscow, there's a Russian you know, point of view, there's an American point of view. But it, in Europe, it seems to be extremely, extremely pro, uh, pro-Ukraine. And I, I, no. I, I see you know, my European friends with, with the blue and yellow and uh, you know, just uh, and some of them are even saying, you know, it's, get, where's Brutus? You know, where, where is Brutus? We need somebody to take care of this this megalomaniac. Um, it's the mad the mad Putin, uh, you know, theory. Uh, it's just like you know, mad Hitler, mad Stalin, madman this, madman that. You know, you 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 convince the people that that the other side is run by a madman, so that they will support your 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 war. Uh, it, it, I don't think Putin is, is crazy, but I'm, I really can't figure him out either. Uh, what about the World Economic Forum? Is, is that connected uh, to Putin still, or has he become a sovereign uh, entity that doesn't need to listen to Western uh, uh, think tanks? Well, so the big, I guess, you know, the, the big news and what a lot of people are talking about now is actually Putin did have a long documented friendship with Klaus Schwab going back to the early 90s before Putin was, you know, president. 
Um, and I'll, actually a lot of a lot of top Russian guys did. What ended up happening is that the World Economic Forum cut all ties to Russia. Be, actually, it was sanctions related. So they can't do business with them because of these very enormous, unspeakable sanctions regime against Russia right now, which is, by the way, is like, you'd have no idea. I mean, getting cut off from SWIFT. Like, I have a, I have a Bank of American card that doesn't work in Russia anymore. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> It's so weird. It's such a it's such a weird it's such a it's such a weird time to be to be in Russia now. It's very unusual. But anyway, what I would say about you know the World Economic Forum uh, angle is, um, while I would say obviously the less ties between the World Economic Forum and Russia sounds good to me. What I would say to this though is that Russia, in many ways, still is pursuing the same sort of technocratic policies that we have everywhere else, you know? And I guess that what people might theorize is while, you know, basically the West is going with sort of this World Economic Forum technocracy and, you know, biosecurity state, the Russians might be doing their own form of it. And I mean, the reality is, you know, when people talk about this multipolar world order, the fact that Russia is... I, I, what seems to be pretty obvious is getting closer to China. For me, I have to be perfectly honest, that doesn't make me super excited. I mean, China is not a great protector of civil liberties. They have quite extraordinary social controls on almost every aspect of life. So that's concerning. And I think what we end up seeing is you have these, you know, it's basically like, uh, I would joke on my, on my blog a few times, I made a few jokes on my blog before about how, you know, uh, you can choose, you know, how anti-NATO you want your QR code to be, you know, at the end of the day, it's a QR code. So it's just, it's very strange. It's very, very strange to see. And, and one would hope that with all this happening, that Russia would make a clean break from what, what I believe to be a very, very scary assault on basically the human spirit, on the human soul, you know, the, the last two years with uh, these COVID restrictions and compulsory vaccinations and the bizarre other policies. And uh, to me, this represents that we are being basically conditioned to accept that we are no longer individuals. So we are, we're just numbers or biohazards or potential security threats. And you know what's very interesting is if you go back a hundred years to World War One, that's when the that's when the our international passport system was created. It was a World War One document, right? It was a temporary document to um, regulate refugees and also keep out spies. And it ended up being a permanent travel document. And before 1914, you could travel the world almost freely without any documents at all. Just you're totally free to go anywhere you want. Yeah. So what, what scares me, what terrifies me is that we are almost in a way reliving this, this like a World War I scenario where we have this very strange, uh, you know, World War I was you had World War I, then you also had the Spanish flu, right? And now we have COVID and we have the not war in Ukraine or whatever. And my, what I, terrifies me the most is that we are really heading for more, more control much, much more control on the individual. And I think that, unfortunately, I don't think Russia is going to escape that. I have to be honest. Yeah, I, I read your, your blogs on that subject, and uh, you're very, very convincing that I... And so, yeah, the WEF, uh, in some form or another, seems to have, have gotten itself into the, the program. The program is the same there. And just like you, you've also written a, a lot about the, the Sputnik uh, V... Uh, vaccine, which a lot of us here thought was maybe something different, was something that it wasn't really part of this evil mRNA thing, and uh, you know, the, I don't know how many whether the AI is now going to going to zap me for <laughs> saying mRNA or not, but you know what I mean. Uh, we we were thinking, you know, well maybe Russia's standing up, you know, to the World yeah, Economic yeah. Forum, well, but but uh, there's no evidence of it, is there? You know, the reality, again, is uh, 
Sputnik V was has very, very obvious direct links to the World Economic Forum. So um, Hermann Greff, who is the CEO of Sparebank, is the largest bank in Russia and it's majority owned by the Russian government. Hermann Greff, before, at least before these sanctions were imposed, and the cutoff with the World Economic Forum was a board of a board of trustees in the World Economic Forum, and this guy played a very integral role in the development of Sputnik V, and so did uh, Sputnik V's main financer. Uh, this is an organization called the Russian Direct Inve Investment Fund. It's a Russian government-controlled fund, investment fund. This uh, guy uh, Kirill Dmitriev, who is a alum of Goldman Sachs and McKinsey, so like super westernized you know basically scam artist and he was uh, one of these you know uh, young global leaders that you always hear about and uh he is the ceo of the russia direct investment fund the russian direct investment fund is the financer of sputnik v and you could go you could go really deep into this but what is also very very interesting about sputnik v is that at the very start of this whole uh you know alleged health crisis Russia immediately partnered with AstraZeneca. Nobody talks about this. They actually signed, uh, you know, this memorandum of cooperation and put uh, Putin even put out a statement saying, this is amazing. We partnered with AstraZeneca. We're going to like work together to save humanity with our, you know, amazing COVID shots. And the original idea, if you go and back and go back and look at these press releases and comments was Russia wanted to create a hybrid shot which was AstraZeneca and Sputnik V, and make it for domestic consumption in Russia. And, and Russia, by the way, produces AstraZeneca's COVID shot domestically and exports it. You know, and so you have to wonder, like, okay, is this really, like, is, is if you really believe that, you know, Sputnik V was this sort of, you know, anti-Big Pharma serum to save the world, like, it just, I, how do you make that argument? You know, it's just very, very difficult, in my opinion, to take that seriously. And the problem, too, is that one of the huge problems here across the world is that there's very, very little transparency, right, with these highly experimental shots. So at least in the United States, you have VAERS, which, although it's flawed, at least gives you some indication, right? At least, at least you can see, like, okay, if, if this thing is really causing problems, there's going to be a huge spike in VAERS. We know that something is probably wrong. Russia doesn't have a VAERS. There's no post-vaccination, publicly available post-vaccination data in Russia. So the Russian government's position is that not a single person has been seriously injured by their vaccine, which is absurd. It's an absurd and humiliating, like it's, a, it's an embarrassing thing to claim. And in fact, I'll give you two really quick examples here of, an, of other things they've said. Uh, the Russian health ministry was asked to provide data on how many fully vaccinated people had died. They said that they wouldn't provide that information because it would, would be inappropriate and it would discourage vaccination. And then a state Duma deputy, so a member of Russia's legislator, went to the Russian health ministry and said, can we see the most recent data you have of Sputnik V? Like, just give us the most recent clinical trial data you have of this drug. And they said they couldn't do it because it was a trade secret. We can't give you the data because it's a trade secret. So it's just, look, I, I, I believe that I'm not even saying that Sputnik V is the most dangerous shot. But if you're someone who is very suspicious of Moderna and Pfizer, which I am, and so suspicious of AstraZeneca, which I am, there's just no way that you could give Sputnik V a free pass. There's just no way. So. All right, John. Uh... I got two more things on my mind. I'm trying to jam them in here. The first one is, uh, what about Kolomoisky? Um, Ihor Kolomoisky, uh, the alleged um, um, big, big money, uh, you know, mafioso type, uh, you know, oligarch, would you like to call him? But uh, uh, how how much uh, press does he get in Russia? Uh, people looking into his involvement in the Ukraine uh, crisis. Yeah, I mean, people people definitely know. I'm sure that more Russians know about him than Americans. I bet no American even knows who Kolomoisky is. Kolomoisky, I mean, <laughs> he's. I mean, of course, he's he's super. He's he's maybe a key player in what's happening right now. Um, as I'm sure you know, I mean, first of all, Kolomoisky, which is so ironic, of course, is is Jewish, and he funded a lot of these 
ultra-nationalist squads that were in Donbass for many years. Kolomoski also had this big beef with Poroshenko, right? And so what that ended up happening is Kolomoski was the owner of uh, Privat Bank, right? Like one of the big banks in Ukraine, which got, I believe, nationalized by Poroshenko or seized or something like that. So Kolomoski is the dude behind Zelensky. So Zelensky was this comedian, right, on one of uh, Kolomoski's television uh, channels that he owned. And uh, he basically created a political party for Zelensky called Servant of the People, which was the television show that Zelensky was on. Zelensky played this fictitious Ukrainian president, right? It's a very, it's such a weird story. It's so bizarre. And, and the, the leading, the largest, the largest political party right now is called Servant of the People, which is this television show that was in Ukraine, right? It's like, it's, it's very, very strange. So Kolomoski is like the sponsor of Zelensky. And um, yeah, I mean, what is this guy doing? What is he up to? What is, what is, who is Zelensky answering to? I think that these are all very serious questions. And again, I want to stress, like, I don't, again, I don't see this as a, as a Russia is right, U.S. is wrong, or U.S. is wrong, Russia is right. At this point, I really feel like it's important for people to just realize that the situation is so critical and so dangerous. We have to de-escalate. And in order to do that, it's not about condoning. It's about understanding, right? So if you really understand what has happened in Ukraine in the last 10 years, I feel like any rational person would be like, all right, we have, this has to stop. We have to stop what's happening, and we have to find some sort of humane, reasonable compromise here. And so Cole Mosky has to be a key player, and you know, people need to know what, he, what he's doing because he's not a good guy. He wouldn't come to the table voluntarily, I don't think. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, so yeah, these are this is part of you know the Gordian knot. How do you unscrew it when it's all tangled up so badly? Um, it, 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 it's tempting to draw the sword um, in, in these situations, and, and unfortunately, it has been drawn. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have Mr. John O'Loughlin interviewing Riley. Riley Wagaman about the Russian Ukraine conflict. You can catch that full interview at McDuff Lives Three on YouTube. Just make sure you go go check it out on McDuff Lives Three and give it a subscribe because all of his other channels have been taken down. Um, and uh, we are going to end the broadcast here on the McDuff Lives channel. Just make sure all you guys uh, on McDuff Lives go to neighborhoodnewsstudio.com to catch up with George Webb on the Ukraine Ukrainian border. <laughs>